Wait, it's going live. It's, it's oh, going I'm live. Okay. <laughs> hey, y'all. I'm James Wright, and welcome to the shop. This is always a fun thing to start off a live because you never know exactly when it is live. <laughs> so uh, today we're going to be doing a bit of a Q and A. Uh, the last uh, several weeks we've been going through making the tool tote. We finally have that all done, and so we're going to take a break, do a Q and A because there's always a bunch of questions that people have, and this is a good time I can grab stuff and show you exactly on the shop. Um, and then hopefully next week we're going to be jumping into then actually doing a detailed build on the straight razor. Uh, so I've got out all of the razors in the mail and so most of you should have them by now. Um, a few of them will probably be coming in the next couple days. Um, so stay tuned for that. We're going to be doing probably two videos. One making the frame and the other one sharpening, grinding it, and then installing it. So this should be a, a really fun project. I was very very happy, excuse me, with this and uh, looking forward to doing it. I've got one other blade to then show that whole process. So we'll be starting that next week, hopefully. Um, yeah, uh, other thing coming up this weekend, I will also uh, be up in the up in Milwaukee for the MWTCA meet. Um, what? This weekend. Yes, this weekend. Sunday? Yes. I was going to say, we have other plans. I know, week. I'm going up. So I'm actually going to be driving <laughs> up to really Milwaukee. Like I'm right. driving up to Milwaukee tomorrow to get lumber for the desk. And then I'm going to be driving up this weekend because our family's doing some things. And then I'm driving back up again Sunday. So I'm going to be in Milwaukee a good bit this weekend. Um, but if you're coming out to that, come up and say hi. And I'd love to, love to hang out. We'll be uh, perusing the tools and having lots of fun. Um, yeah, other than that, I have... Uh, I'm going to be, the, there's the meet coming up here in Loves Park, about you know, a mile and a half away from my house. Uh, that one is in April. Um, I want to say April 15th, but I'm probably wrong on that one. Uh, and then there is the national meet coming up in June, uh, the June 16th, 17th, 18th, I think it is, and that's in Green Bay. And so I'll be at all of those. Uh, there's a slight chance that I will be at the Makers, uh, the Makers Summer Camp in Ohio. But uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. I'm still waiting on uh, hearing back from them and what all's going on. But uh, yeah, that's what we have coming up. So what, uh, what questions do we have today? Uh, one question that I did get ahead of time is a question about dovetails. And he asked, do I need a dovetail saw to cut dovetails? And the answer is no. You can cut, any dove, you can cut dovetails with any saw in the shop. Um, if I wanted to, I could use my big Rubo style frame saw and cut dovetails. Now I'd probably stay a good ways away from the line and then chisel back to it um, because it's not quite as accurate as a dovetail saw. The dovetail saw is just a very, very fine-tuned um, saw that goes a little bit slower, a little bit more accurate, um, and it's just easier to maintain an exact line. Uh, it's a rip saw for very delicate small cuts. Uh, if you don't have a dovetail saw, the next best thing I would actually say is use a hacksaw. And I've done a couple of videos where I've actually used a hacksaw to create dovetails. It is a surprisingly good saw for cutting dovetails. It uh, takes a little bit of getting used to because the, the handle isn't always in line with the blade, um, but it can cut really good dovetails. Uh, if you don't have that, then a big saw, uh, you know, a panel saw that you get in the store will do just the same thing. You just probably want to stay a little bit closer, a little bit farther away from the line because it has a larger set and therefore it creates more uh, variance on either side of the plate. But no, you don't need to buy a dovetail saw. And when, when people come to me, what, what should be my first saw? And most people are thinking dovetail saw should be the first saw. And I, no, um, the first saw that I generally suggest most people get is a carcass saw. Uh, this is the saw that I use more than any other saw in my shop. This is what all the joinery is done on. If I want to, I could do dovetails on this. Uh, it is what I, what I cut all my boards and pieces to length. I make almost every joinery cut done with this. Um, after this, then a good panel saw, then maybe a good tenon saw, and then a dovetail saw. Um, a dovetail saw is nice for very specific things, but it is honestly one of the least used saws in the shop. Uh, so, yeah, that would be my, my list. What questions we got? Let's see. Jonathan Haney asked, if I want to sharpen a plain iron with sandpaper on glass, what grit slash type of paper is best? Uh, type of paper, it really doesn't matter that much. You're going to have some people who will tell you what particular oxide works better and faster. Um, but in the end, for sharpening blades, 
the, the wear and tear is, is not going to be that much difference between them. Um, so usually I'm going to tell people go and get not the cheapest stuff as that just rubs off quickly, but you know, the, the decent mid-grade paper. Um, and usually for grits, it depends on how bad the iron is. Um, if the iron needs a lot of work and has some heavy chips, I might start with something as, as coarse as like 36 or 50 grit sandpaper. Uh, most of the time I'm going to be starting somewhere around 100 grit sandpaper. And then I will go 100, 200, 500, 1,000, 3,000. Um, and those would be my, my broad stroke grits. If I'm just addressing a blade, I'm just cleaning it up, I'm probably going to go something around like 300, 500, 1,000. Um, and I, I like that grit range to be pretty good. Um, sandpaper actually ends up cutting very similarly to diamonds as opposed to whetstones. Because uh, whetstones, you actually create a slurry on top of the stone. And that slurry, slurry actually polishes the blade. Um, with sandpapers and diamonds, there's actually an aggregate that scratches the blade. Um, so it's a, it's a very different form of cutting. Um, and that's what leaves kind of confusing because you can, you can never get a polished mirror finish off a diamond plate or sandpaper because all the scratches are in the same orientation. On a whetstone, you can get a mirror polish because the scratches go in an oscillating fashion due to the slurry you're working on there um, as it moves around to get out of the way of the iron. Um, so yeah, usually those are my, my, my standards is something around like uh, 300, 500, 1000 and then onto a strop and you're good to go. Um, if you really want to get into it, go up to a 2000 and then onto the strop. But I don't see a huge amount of benefit from that. Good question though. What's next? Let's see. Mm. Pacific Coast Piper says, Hey, greetings from a carver in Oconagon County, Washington. Mm -hmm. Have you ever worked with black locust wood? Uh, yes. Um, I've got a couple sticks up there. Um, I've done, I haven't done a lot with it. Um, I've done a few, um, I did a couple plaques with it. I've done some carving with it. Um, and, uh, I, well, I worked probably the most of it with, um, when I worked out at Tally, Tally Ho, uh, actually in Washington, um, we were helping, uh, uh, I was helping him make uh, trunnels, tree nails, uh, for the boat, and those are all being made out of locusts. Uh, so some good stuff. Um, rot resistant, very hard, very stringy. It's like ash and oak, but harder. Um, <laughs> uh, for hand tools, it is not an easy wood. It's very, very difficult, um, but it is a very durable wood. Uh, and will last a long, long time as long as you're willing to put in the effort to, to cut through it. But yeah, fun stuff. What's next? Let's see. Here. If anyone does have questions, if you can put like question at the beginning of it or something like that to notify it, it just makes it easier to pop out in the chat. Oh, it's pronounced Oak Anagan. See, I was pronouncing it like you would in Wisconsin. Akanagan? <laughs> Oak Anagan? <laughs> you know, we, we pronounce it like... A it's an Indian walk. name. <laughs> Okanagan is not. I mean, that's not saying that it wasn't an Indian name. It's just not the Wisconsin pronunciation <laughs> for how things would have been. <laughs> so let's see. Garrett Dillon asked, what got you into woodworking? My father. My father got me into woodworking. He, uh, he picked up the hobby. Uh, we moved to a, a church in middle of Michigan, Frederick, Michigan. And one of the, the guys in the church had a woodworking business. So he had a fully stocked shop and said, you know, if you ever want to woodwork, come on out and use the shop. So my dad got into it and made a uh, dining room table. It was one of the first projects he made. Um, and he'd been doing, you know, carpentry and house construction and things like that before. Um, but I came along with him. Um, so whenever he was in the shop, I was in the shop. And uh, we, I just kind of grew up around that. And it was his hobby and it became my hobby and uh, something I've loved ever since. So it's something I've been doing for the last, what, 30 years now? <laughs> oh, 31 years, something like that. It's been a while. <laughs> but it gets in your blood and uh, you can't get it out. They haven't made a pill for that one yet. What's next? Uh, let's see, Digimer asked, any plans to visit the Acorn to Arabella guys? Oof, I would love to. Um, yeah, that would be that'd be a fun one. We were um, looking at possibly doing a, a family vacation out that way. Um, 
that would be that would be a good one. I, I would love to to be there when they do some steam bending and show the actual the amount that they're bending because they're not like you know steam bending chair rails and things like that. They're steam bending beams that are you know two inch thick by four inch wide and putting some rather drastic twist into them. Um, and, and the the ribs that the, uh, the the boat is made out of are all steam bent to shape, um, as opposed to um, like with Tally Ho, he's finding bends and trees and cutting them to match, and so cutting them out of the tree, they're actually bending them into shape, and it's an absolutely cool project. Um, I would love to get out there, um, but it is not on the the schedule yet. someday, mm -hmm. someday. But uh, yeah, there's there's, a, there's there's quite a few things out on that the East Coast that I would like to get out to. I'd love to do a, a tour of tool shops because the East Coast really is a, a hotbed for hand tools and being able to find them. What's next? Let's see. Um, okay, Tyson Leba, Leba has like two questions. Cool. So first one is when you're cutting larger mortise and tenons and they don't fit evenly, how much play would you say is acceptable? Um, that, you know, that much. <laughs> it depends on how it's being used um, and how it's going to be, you know, glued. Um, if you're using a, a good glue and good gap filling properties, um, a good bit of play, you can, you can mess around it, especially if you're going to be doing something like a, um, a draw bore pinning it as well. Uh, you can get away with a lot of play. Um, if it's something that you're intending to be taking apart and putting together, such as in a, a Moravian workbench, um, you do want a decent amount of play in that because you want to be able to take them apart and put them back together. If it's a fine piece of joinery and a very stiff connection and there's not going to be any pins through it, then you're going to want it really tight. I'm going to want it to the point where I'm actually having to use a mallet to tap it in. Um, but on my old bench, uh, there were several mortise and tenons in there where gravity alone would let it fall into place without any issue. Um, and as long as there is wood connection, the glue will generally do that. Um, I would suggest using a, a decent um, gap filling glue, which if you want to see a list of those, I have an entire video, a pile of videos where I go into glue testing. Um, and so I would probably do something with the uh, um, uh, uh, wood weld plastic uh, uh, resin from DAP. Those are, uh, I was very, very impressed with those. Um, or uh, um, Type-On 2 is still actually pretty decent at gap filling. Uh, but I'd probably go with that or even an epoxy glue depending upon the application. Um, but I mean, if you're, if you're in there and you've got like a, you know, an eighth inch of a gap, um, you may end up wanting to shim that to fill it in. <laughs> so every, every, uh, every joint is a little bit different. But if you want to have specifics on it, send me an email and I'll um, take a look at it. Or the best thing you can do is shoot a video and showing how easy it slides in and out or how much play there is in it. What's next? All right, and then the second thing he says is, or help with tips on cutting cleaner shoulders. <laughs> More practice. Um, usually, for most people, the problem that they have is the cleaning it up and bringing it back to the line. Um, so for a beginner, you usually saw it on the line, you try to stay away from the line, and then you chisel it and plane it back to the line. And that's where things get into the issues. You fit it and it doesn't work, and you fit it and it doesn't work, and you fit it and it doesn't work. And every time you're taking off a little bit more and a little bit more, and then suddenly you put it in, it's like, Phew! oh, it's loose. Where'd that go? It was, it, it was that, that fiddling is where most of the problems come in. Um, and so the, the best solution is get good with a saw so you can cut right on the line, and your cleanup is just a pass or two at the plane. Um, that, that is what you're, what you're shooting for. That is the, the quality, it's faster you're going to be getting a much better product out of it if you, can, if you can saw smack on that line. But that goes to sawing technique. And there's a lot of things you can learn with sawing technique with, with your body posture and making sure everything is in line um, and the, the way the, the saw itself is set up. But in the end, practice. Um, it's pretty much the only way to, to get better at it. Um, I can tell you every technique and under the sun, but until it's actually done, um, it's just the way it is. But that's usually the problem is the, the fiddling, getting it close and uh, bringing it back to the line after sawing. Um, so the less of that you can do, the better off you'll be. But everyone's different, so I would have to see your particular individual to see what's up with it. What um, we got? Brian Ross asked, I am looking to build a jack plane. Is red oak a 
acceptable and how long do you recommend it to be? Uh, a jack plane is usually 15 to 18 inches depending upon what you want out of it. Um, and once you start talking about plane bodies and proper woods, you're going to start a lot of arguments because if, the, if you're talking to a purist, it must only be made out of beach, European beach. And then there are others like, mm, no, you could probably make it out of hard maple or American beach. Those, are, those would be acceptable. And then there's other people like, yeah, you can make it out of whatever you want. Um, because you can make it out of whatever you want. If you want to make a plain body out of balsa, go for it. It's not going to last long and it'll probably ding up pretty quickly. But you could do it. <laughs> actually, that sounds like a really good video. Uh, I saw um, a couple guys actually making it out of palm which is a horrible wood, um, just a pain to work with, but it'll do it. Um, personally, I really like oak. Um, it is a little bit softer than most people would like for it. It is very stringy um, and, and it's splintery, so you've got to make sure your grain direction is going well on it. Um, you don't want your grain going forward on the plane, otherwise it'll catch on things and tear out on the bottom. Um, you want your, your grain direction to be um, flowing nicely with that. But it'll work. Uh, will it last as long as a beach plane? No, um, but very few people are going to use them enough to actually wear them out over time. So I would say if that's what you've got and it's your first one, go for it because you're going to learn a lot on the first one. You're going to make a lot of mistakes and that's okay because once you learn how to do it once, you can do it again. And then next time it wears out, it'll be like, hey, I'm going to do this a little bit better. I'm going to try something different. And by that time, who knows, maybe you have a block of maple on hand or something of that nature. So go for it. Have fun and uh, that'll do you nicely. What's next? Let's see. Chase Wallace asks, how do you get most of your tools? Um, more than half of my tools I've purchased at, at Tool Meets, particularly through the MWTCA. Uh, if you go to mwtca.org, um, you'll see a whole bunch of meets that are across a large chunk of the US. Um, that being said, there are a lot of other meets around the world and other places. Um, tools, there are stores that specifically sell tools. Um, I, I rarely, rarely ever buy tools online. Um, there are so many of them out there um, in most of the places. If you go down into like uh, Louisiana, Texas, that area is pretty hard to find. Um, in California, it's a bit harder to find. Um, but if you want to see a map of everything I know of, there's uh, the handtoolfinder.com. Handtoolfinder.com. Um, in there, I have, a, I have a map of the entire world, of every place I've been told about, every tool sale I know about, every antique store that sells tools. Um, underneath that, I have a listing of all the tool collecting associations, such as MWTCA. Uh, there's PAST, which is in California. There's the West Coast, which is mostly Oregon and Wisconsin, uh, Washington. And there's the, the Rockies, there's a Southern, there's, um, there's uh, Canada, there's Australia. Uh, there is uh, um, Europe, um, and there are several other tool collecting organizations along those lines. Um, and then underneath that, I have a long list of online tool sellers that I trust. And these are people who predominantly sell just hand tools. Um, so if ever I have a piece and I'm looking for a part, usually I'm going to go down that list of online sellers, and I'm actually going to go down there and say, uh, hey, do you have this part? Do you have this part? Do you have this part? And two or three of them will come back and say, yeah, I've got one on hand. Or I'll find someone's like, uh, no, I don't have any, but uh, Joe Schmo over there has one. Um, and so if I'm ever looking apart, that's usually the first place I go is going down the list of, of tool sellers on there. So yeah, um, that's probably where I get most of my tools though are at tool meets, just because um, everything's there. <laughs> But I, you know, when I first got going, most of my tools came from estate sales because around here, estate sales are a fantastic place for it. Um, if you go onto the west, uh, the east coast, um, down into like the Tennessee, Kentucky area, through that, that you'll find a lot at uh, um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, swap meets. Um, what, what's the word? Like flea market? Flea market, there's the word. That's the reason I married her. Um, <laughs> flea markets around here just don't have hand tools. Um, I, haven't, I haven't found one here that has them in a, in a long time. Um, but out on the East Coast in that area, the, that is a great place for them. So, yeah, what's next? Um, let's see. 
Sober Living with Brian Franklin asked, what job did you have before YouTube? <laughs> I had them all. Um, I worked all over the place. My undergrad was in biblical counseling. My master's is in technical theater. Uh, my last job was a uh, supervisor of a metalworking shop in a, uh, a theater out in Pennsylvania. Uh, and then I became a stay-at-home dad, and that led me into this, which I'm still a stay-at-home dad, but I get to work with that. So, um, I, My wife is the one who makes the, the majority of the income, so she's the reason that Wood by Right exists. You can say <laughs> thank you to her. <laughs> But yeah, I've done all sorts of things. I, I've owned my own construction business. I um, owned a lawn mowing business. I, I've um, I worked as a custodian. Um, I've driven vehicles. I did appliance installation. Um, I've, I've done a little of everything. Uh, you know, roofing, construction, um, finished carpentry. Uh, you name it, I've, I've, I've done it at one time or another. So, yeah, Just as next? long as it's not medical. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ain't no blood getting near me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, Stephen Deswan asked, what other YouTubers would you like to collaborate with? I love doing collaborations, personally. Um, I, I, I regularly reach out to other channels to do collaborations, um, and so I'm, I'm wide open to, to that. Um, I've, I've been trying to get one with Alex Steele. I think that would be a lot of fun to, to mix the, the hand tool woodworking with his um, quality of metalworking. Um, that would be an absolute blast. Um, I, I, I like kind of going across the board and doing something with you know, a boat building group or uh, something in a slightly different field. I, I like doing those because you kind of, kind of get the cross-pollinization of ideas. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm wide open. Um, so if you have a contact with someone you'd like me to do, you know, shoot my name and say, hey, do a collab with him. I'd be glad to. What's next? Hang on, I gotta figure out where I am. Did you? How do you insure your tools? Do you need a special writer, or did you have to find a special insurance company? Um, my tools really aren't insured, other than uh, the homeowner's insurance. Um, so they're covered under my homeowner's insurance. Um, but probably not enough. <laughs> Nowhere near enough. Uh, so yeah, I probably should uh, to get that, but no, I don't have any particular insurance to it. So If something were to happen and I'd lose my tools, then I guess that would be a reason I'd have to go buy more tools. Huh? I was going to say. Hmm. <laughs> Such a problem to have. <laughs> As the South Africans would say, oh, shame. <laughs> All right, um, there's a bunch of questions. All right, uh, la, la, la. so from Germany, Moba3010 asks, did you always work with hand tools only? If not, did it take time getting used to the slower workflow compared to power tools? No, um, most of my life I've been power tool only. Um, like to the point I have a set of chisels and they're in my shop, but they've never been sharpened and I never even taken them out of the package. Um, up until I started hand tools, I literally had a package of, um, of Craftsman black handled chisels and they were in the package. Um, and that was as close to hand tools as I ever got. Never owned a hand plane. Um, and so uh, power tools were all I did. Um, and through the process of moving a half dozen times and uh, becoming a stay-at-home dad and all the things that went into that. I sold all my power tools. And uh, then one day I thought, you know, I want to get back into woodworking. And I saw someone actually working with hand tools. And I thought, this is phenomenal. Number one, it's quiet. So I can do it while the kids are napping. Number two, I have no problem with the kids being in the shop when I'm working because I don't have, you know, power tools flying around. They can be over banging on the corner while I'm over here chiseling away. Uh, number three, there's no dust, so having it in my house is not going to be a problem with the dust floating up into the, the house. Uh, it's, it can be done in a very small space, so my shop originally was 8 foot by 10 foot, and I could do woodworking in that space. It was just this eye-opening thing, um, and suddenly it was learning woodworking all over again. Uh, it, was, it was this whole new joy for woodworking that I'd had my entire life. But now I could express it in a different way and actually learn some other things about the wood that I didn't know. 
Um, so yes, hand tools are not my original forte, um, but they are my current love. Well, other than my wife and kids. And, okay. Hand tools are nice. <laughs> You're like real careful today. I don't know. Did you did did you get in trouble recently that I've forgotten? <laughs> she hasn't found out yet. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody tell her, please. <laughs> uh, which video do I need to go back and watch? <laughs> watch some of them. Yeah. But I mean, that that's one of the things that surprises a lot of people. Is I'm actually just as comfortable, if not more comfortable, with power tools than I am with hand tools. Because uh, I've spent more time with them. Give it a few more years and that'll change. <coughs> about, about 25 years in the power tool world and about five years in the hand tool world. What's next? Let's see. Mm, Santos Tejeda asked, having an issue st stabilizing a saddle rack from side to side movement. I have placed the dowel on the back and at a 45 degree and a 45 degree brace. Any ideas making a 90 degree joint more rigid? Um, I would have to see what joint you're talking about. So go ahead and send me pictures. Um, my email address is in the, the about page um, on YouTube. Um, so I, I guess I don't know what joiner you're using or whatnot on there. Mm, but yeah, send me the link. Sorry. <laughs> Let's see, Louie91 asked, how is the chisel test coming along and how long until it drives you mad? <laughs> um, I am, uh, I think I am seven chisels into the 16 chisels, I think. No, I have 17 chisels now. I have 17 chisels because we could pick up another one. Um, so almost halfway. Um, I haven't been able to do it in the last few days due to everything coming in, but hopefully this week I'm able to get one or two more chisels done. Um, each chisel that I test is around eight hours worth of work. Um, so I'm trying to test one or two chisels a week. So theoretically it is somewhere around <laughs> six to ten weeks out until they're all done. Um, so probably sometime in April. Um, April, early May, somewhere in that range, I should be done with it. But it's uh, there's some interesting things in there so far. Um, I, I've been very, uh, very surprised by some of them. Uh, like the Aldi chisels that I use, um, I've actually been really happy with those. And then some of the other chisels that I thought were really good, after doing testing, I'm like, hmm, I might want to rethink that. So yeah, if you are a patron, you have access to the uh, um, to the, the data we've been collecting as we come in. So. Yes, it's going to be a very, very fun video. <laughs> What's next? Let's see. Digimer asked, there's a video I saw recently suggesting steam bending kiln dried wood isn't advised. Opinions? And would you pay the premium for air dried? Um, you can steam bend kiln dried wood. Um, if it's really nice and straight and it's really clean and you're not bending it too far, you can steam bend it. Uh, that's, that's not a problem. It doesn't bend as well as air dried wood. Um, if, you're, if you're really picky or you're going to be doing a pretty severe bend, um, then air dried wood is the, is the way to go. Um, it will give you a much better result and has less chance of splintering out. But even that being said, there are times when, when trying to bend um, air dried wood will let you down. <laughs> so it really depends on how much the difference is where you're at. Um, where, I at where I'm at, almost all of my wood is air dried just because I buy a lot from local sawyers um, or people like Matt Cremona who mill it and it's been out in their backyard and that is where I get a lot of my wood from and it's just air dried is the, the cheaper option in that method. Um, so. It's not something I have to worry about, but if you have to go to a lumber yard um, and that's your only source of wood, then yeah, you're probably gonna be spending more for air dried wood. Um, but every place is gonna be a little bit different. And if you want to find air dried wood, one of the places I usually say is go on Craigslist or Facebook and look up local sawyers. Um, try and find someone with a with a wood miser and he just mills up logs. You can find some really good deals on some really amazing pieces of wood. 
Um, and that's that's where I get a lot of my stuff. And it's just, you know, Joe Schmo in his backyard with a wood miser, and he has a pile of logs that he's been milling up. Um, usually a pretty good price. Sometimes they're still a bit green. You have to let them dry a little bit longer. Uh, but hey, if you're going to be steam bending, green's good. That, 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 that helps. <laughs> What's next? Well, Alan did a, as he says, drive by Coco Fun Heezing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, so Alan. So I think that calls for a joke. Ah, yes. You got one today? I, I, Does she have one? She's I, got one. Here I've we go. I'm ready. Okay, ready. Here's the mom joke Husband, I want you to have this bracelet. It belonged to my grandmother. Wife, why does it say do not resuscitate? <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I hope somebody else uses that I might have to one. get one of those. <laughs> what? Why are you looking at me like that? What's the next question, babe? You get to raise all those children by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Back to the questions. All right. Pacific Coast Piper. What is the weirdest wood you've worked with? Palm. Um, but palm really isn't a wood, but it's, it's, like, it's like planting a bundle of grass. Um, it's very, very weird, splintery, painful stuff. You're always getting splinters on it, and it never behaves, and you have to make sure you're going perfectly with the grain, or you will not get anything done. Um, palm is just totally wacky stuff. And, uh, yeah, I tried turning palm once. Not happy. <laughs> it's like it's like thousands of toothpicks suddenly flying up at you as you're, as you're, you're turning. And, uh, it was interesting. <laughs> What's next? All right. So James Crandall asks, would you make a mallet out of hickory? I have a person on Facebook willing to give me free logs if I make them a mallet like you did in one of your videos. Yeah. Yeah. Hickory would be a great wood for it. Um, very, very good. Hickory is, is um, almost identical to oak in most of its properties. It's harder than oak. Uh, it is uh, a bit more brutal on the tools than oak, but it is a, a great wood. And if you want a, a you know a heavy duty joiner's mallet, hickory is the stuff. That, that's a great choice for it. So yeah, have fun, and uh, be warned, it's going to be a lot of work, but it will make a good mallet. So this question is out of order, but it's a follow up to that one. So Chuck Chuck Bueller asked along with James this question: I just made a mallet out of mesquite. How well do you think it will hold up? Um, pretty well. <laughs> mesquite is, a, is another annoying wood. The only problem with mesquite is that you, your hands turn black when you're working with it. They just like rub off this black and you, everything that touches it turns black. Um, <laughs> so if you're working with light wood, it might not be the best thing. Um, but yeah, mesquite will hold up really nicely. It's a, it's a very good wood. Um, it's not quite as structurally homogenous, so there's, there's a better, better chance of it splintering off. Um, but if the mallet's well made, no, no problem at all. That would, uh, that would end up being a good one. What's next? Uh, let's see. Cat's Seal asked, is there a no VOC epoxy that you can recommend? Um, I have no idea. That is not something I look at. Um, yeah, I don't know. I have not, uh, not messed with that. Um, oh, wait, remember um, Ecopoxy. Uh, yeah, Ecopoxy, if I remember correctly, was no VOCs. Um, it is a very, very slow curing epoxy. comes out like water, beautifully liquid. It pours and it runs into every pore um, and crystal clear. It's what I poured my table out of. Uh, the only downside to it is it takes three days to, three days to cure. Um, and you just have to be very, very careful with it because if there's any crack, hole, or crevice, it will find it and it will all run out. <laughs> And There's a reason my floor is epoxy finished. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, I, I, that's not something I have messed with, so I don't have any... Uh, um, I've never looked into no VOC epoxy, so sorry. Okay, so Uncle Bobby's Hobby had asked you a question earlier about um, setting up the wooden smoothing plane and not it doesn't expel shavings past the wedge, and then... He said the wedge descends too far because the sides have gravelly cav 
gradually chipped away. Can I reshape it or do I need to make a new wedge? Um, the sides of the wedge have, have okay, oh, so here's what we got. Um, let me pull this one down and, and show you up here closer to this. Just get these onion here. So when he was talking about, uh, he asked me some questions about um, uh, setting up a, a wooden plane. So here I've got a, a wooden plane and a wedge. Um, and so what happens is the joint between, so imagine for a moment this is the iron, and the wedge is here. The joint here um, will often catch chips. And so there needs to be a really good connection between these so that there isn't a ledge that the chips can wedge underneath and get stuck on. That's, that's one of the most common issues. Uh, but it sounds like in your case, what's happening is this little track here on both sides gets crushed down and worn out. And so these get thinner. So when it goes in, the wedge will actually go farther into the body than it should and get close to the bottom. Uh, in which case, what you can do is you can plane off this whole angle and bring this all down into a new true thickness, or you can make a whole new wedge. Um, but just planing this down to bring this surface down to the same thickness as this outside edge um, should bring it back to where it is. But then, once you get this all done, you want to make sure when it fits onto the iron that you have a nice clean joint there so that nothing can get stuck on that edge. So I hope that answers your question. Um, but if, if there's enough material left on the iron, uh, left on the whole wedge, the easiest thing is just to plane this down and reshape it. Unless you have one with a, with a, with a shaped mouth, then you've got a good bit more work to do on you. Um, in which case then, yeah, make a new wedge would, would probably answer that question. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, if not, let me know. So Pacific Coast Piper said, this one is for Sarah. What is your favorite thing he's made you? Probably the dresser because I use it all the time. I'm trying to think if there's anything that you've made me. Not the bed. Oh yeah, we use that too. Um, I was trying to think if there were smaller boxes, things. jewelry box, heart carving table. I think I like them all for different reasons but from a practicality standpoint probably the dresser is my favorite that was a fun one it's pretty <laughs> that was a uh, that, that was a labor of love that was a lot of work there was 108 different pieces of wood in there so it was a that was a fun build yeah it was that one was resawing all of the bottoms on it it was uh, let me see if I remember correctly. I want to say 36 Oh, the feet. table's good. We use the table all the time, too, and that's pretty cool looking. Too. Dining table, yeah. That was 36 feet of resawing 11-inch thick material. 36 feet long, white oak. Uh, all the drawer bottoms are solid white oak resawn. It was, yeah, it was cool. <laughs> it's solid. <laughs> it's heavy. All right, let's see. Tommy D'Souza, two says, hey, Sarah, do you ever get mad because sawdust or, or oak shavings get tracked um, by to the house? My wife is always on me about that. So I would say James is pretty good about not bringing things upstairs. I mean, we have a door right here, and the door leads right into our laundry room, so it's pretty close. When he hasn't swept recently and, you know, a sock drops between my transfer from washing machine to dryer, I can get a little frustrated, but very rarely do things make it upstairs. Maybe a stray curl every so often. Yeah, I don't. I don't wear my shoes. No, the throughout clogs the house. don't leave. Because I have. Basement. That's one of the reasons why I, I, I got clogs is I take them off when I leave the the shop, and so I needed something I could quickly slip in and out of. And so I was using flip flops, but then people in the the video start complaining about flip flops. But these, I can, I can, I clip them off when I leave the shop, and then I have socks for the rest of the house. Um, and then when I come in, I just, I step into it as I'm walking in. It takes me absolutely no time, um, and so that's why I wear those. Um, yeah, they're really. I, I don't have um, sawdust is not an issue. Um, the hand tools rarely create much sawdust. I love how you're answering my question. Sorry. <laughs> 
I have to say, the thing I think I get more mad about is tripping over the stupid clogs. Because it lives <laughs> right at the entrance of my uh, laundry, laundry room. room. So if anything, that's what I get more frustrated about. But uh, I mean, well, there was I guess that, just there was sweeping that one maybe a little bit more. But that's just because I'm a midget and can barely fit and grab things out of my washing machine. So There was that one curl hanging from the ceiling. Oh, hallelujah, that's gone. You took it down. I did. I replaced it with roses. <laughs> but anyways, um, yeah, I mean, if it's just straight hand tools, it's usually not. Yeah. Too bad. The only time I have, I have dust is when I have to do some sanding, but usually I connect up to a vacuum. Yeah, that and, or uh, he puts a plastic barrier. Yeah. So, I can't complain too much. Too much. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Other things I might complain about. What's next? Oh, uh, let's see. Carlo... Liquidine, Lucidine. I'm probably but but butchering that name. Let's see. What power tool do you suggest can help with productivity along with hand tools? Um, the next power tool I would probably suggest, um, the first power tool to, to, to hand tools would probably be a thickness planer um, or a, a handheld powered planer because um, that takes more time than anything else is, is flattening and truing and squaring up boards. Um, that just that, that is a very time-consuming process. Um, so being able to um, y even making like a sled so you can joint with your thickness planer, um, you can do a lot with just a thickness planer. And so usually that would be my main suggestion. Um, and also like uh, Shannon Rogers over at the Hand Tool School, that's his as well. Um, Paul Sellers, uh, his was a bandsaw. Um, and he would prefer to use a bandsaw rather than that. Um, but he buys a lot of his lumber S4S, um, so it becomes already smooth, um, so they don't have to worry about that as much. So if you do buy a lot of smooth, then probably getting a, a, a bandsaw would be your next best choice. Um, yeah, I, I would say bandsaw over table saw because you can anything you can do well, most anything you can do with a table saw, you can also do with a bandsaw, but a bandsaw you can also turn. Uh, it's just a bandsaw is not quite as fast as a table saw for long, straight, quick rips. Um, so that would be my general suggestion. What's next? You have a super chat. I have a super chat? What is it? From Mr. Justin uh, Lang. Justin Lang, thank you. Super chat. Should I do another dance? Well, I was going to say I have a mom joke. But oh, yeah, do the mom do joke. That it's probably too. far better than the <laughs> dancing. <laughs> all right. Out of all the inventions in the last 100 years, the dry erase board is probably the most remarkable. <laughs> I spent all week looking for it. <laughs> She's good at them. <laughs> I got to have my hobbies, too. <laughs> All right, let's see. Um, Tyson Leva asked, when cutting larger joinery, like for a bench, I've been using a panel saw because of the size. Is there anything better? I have a tenon saw, but it's 15 PPI, and it seems slow and clunky in the cut. It all depends on your personal choice. Um, I will use a panel saw to do joinery quite, about, quite often. Um, if, if The bigger the joinery, the bigger the tooth, just because I need to go faster. But keep in mind, the bigger the tooth, the rougher the cut. Um, and so you're going to have to do more smoothing and truing up to bring it back close to the line. Um, so it's just the trade-off one way or the other. Um, if it is a big piece of joinery, I'm going to use a big tooth saw to get through it quickly. Yes, I'm going to spend more time cleaning it up and bringing it back to the line, but I'm saving time in the cutting. So it's six of one after another. Which one do you want, do you want to spend more time cutting, or do you want to spend more time truing it up and bringing it back to the line? Um, but there's nothing, nothing wrong at all with doing joinery with a panel saw. Um, I've done joinery with my big hand saw. Uh, you know, four tooth per inch. It cuts really quickly. And if it's, if, it, if it's recently sharpened and recently tuned up, I can get a really nice clean cut off of that and stay pretty close to a line. So there, there are a lot of things you can do with, with bigger saws. Um, and just get better at hand sawing. <laughs> What's next? All right. Dennis Miko asks, when gluing panels, do you glue panels first, then cut to size? 
and plane to thickness or vice versa? Ooh, this is one of the big differences between hand tools and power tools. Um, with power tools, you thickness plane everything down and then you glue up your panel. And the problem is if there's any bit of wavering between them, then you've got this joint, that you've got this step in between the two and you can't run them through the thickness planer again because now they're too wide. Um, and so that's why they created dominoes and dowels and biscuits is the dominoes, dowels and biscuits will allow you to adjust the, the difference in there. They really don't add any strength at all to the joint. Um, and, and in many cases, they actually will weaken the joint. Um, biscuits will weaken a joint. Biscuits do not add any strength at all to the joint, but they will align the joint so you get a nice flush connection between the two and you can just sand it off afterwards. Um, with hand tools, I actually like to glue up the rough cut, so I have saw marks, and then I'm gonna come through and hand plane it down because there's really no difference between hand planing one board and then hand planing another board as opposed to hand planing two boards when they're together. It's the same amount of time one way or the other. So I might as well do them after they've been glued up because then I have to worry about treating them up afterwards. Because if I thickness plane them all beforehand, then I have to go through the whole problem again of lining them back up. Um, so why not just glue them ahead of time and just plane them down, not, not, not worry about it. Because there's, there's, my planes have no maximum, maximum width. If the board's 48 inches across, I can still flatten them. Um, whereas I can't run 48 inches through a 12 inch thickness planer. So yeah, um, I like to plane them afterwards. But you'll talk to other people who will do it other ways. Um, it is kind of one of those power tool mindsets versus hand tool mindsets. Um, with the power tools, you get everything very close and then you do all your joinery. Um, with hand tools, you get things rough, you do your joinery and then you bring everything down to nice and true. Um, so different way and different sides. What's next? Let's see, Matthew Sheriff asks, do you have any videos on how to do mitered half laps? Um, yes, actually I do. I have at least one, if not two. Um, actually, were they half laps? I don't know. Because I know I have the, the mitered bridle joint which is basically a mitered half lap with an extra tongue on the outside. Um, but I was doing the, uh, the joinery window and we actually did, uh, no, I can't pull it down. It's a, it's a joinery window, so you can imagine four boards. And so that gives you four corners and then it also has cross hatching in there. So you have these, these four windows. And so that gives you a total of nine different joints across it. And so one of those joints was a mitered, I believe it was mitered half lap or was it a mitered braille joint? Um, very, very similar joint. Uh, and then I think I did a standalone video on that as well. So definitely take a look at that. You have, let's see, how to make a half, you did a half lap joint live. Oh, it's half lap, not mitered. Mitered yeah. trimmer. I was just Googling it to see. I don't know that you have. No, I don't think I've done a mitered half lap. I think I've done the mitered bridle joint, yeah. which is basically the same thing, but the bridle, the, if you can do a, if you can do a mitered bridle joint, you can do a mitered half lap. It's the exact same thing. It's just the bridle joint is harder. So, yeah. What's next? Okay. Whoa. Whoa. What? There's a lot of orange. Tyson, thank you. Ah, thanks, Tyson. No. Okay. Hang on. I gotta bring out a good one. What is that emoji? Thanks for being you. Well, thank you. I will continue to be it's there, a... even though my wife tries to change me. What does that look for? <laughs> oh, ah. Uh, should I do my Roman joke? Yeah, yeah. Okay. A Roman walks into a bar, holds up two fingers, and says, five beers, please. <laughs> Did you do the fingers? <sighs> Let them think for a second. <laughs> well, one of my favorites is a neutrino drifts into a bar. And then drifts out the back door. <laughs> oh, okay. If I'm going to do that one, I've got to do the next one. A, a Higgs boson drifts into a bar. I know, excuse me. A Higgs boson drifts into a, a Catholic church. And the priest comes running up and says, Hey, you're not allowed in here. And the Higgs boson looks at the priest and says, But without me, how do you have mass? 
Do you know how many times I've heard that joke? <laughs> what? I said, do you know how many times I've heard you tell that joke? <laughs> <laughs> I love physics. Well, Tyson, you got a three for one in that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thanks, <you>. man. <laughs> What's next? Oh, la, 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 la. No, I'm not going to sing. Jonathan Goss asked, what is your personal favorite wood carving V gouge? A smaller one for carving not work into the blade handles? Question mark. Um, I have a series of them, and I can't say I have a, a favorite one. I, they're just different sizes for different uses. Um, I, have, I have several that are very narrow walls, um, and I like those for a lot of the detail. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I have a, a favorite one because I just have a selection of them. Um, so I'm sorry. I have I have several that are file. I have several that are two cherries, and I like them both the same. They're they're both great great tools. What's next? Uh, let's see. Justin Lang asked, "Are there practical advantages to a Stanley bedrock plane over a Bailey that I might wish to consider when shopping around?" Um, yes and no. Uh, I actually do not own any bedrocks. Um, I I personally do not see the benefit in the pricing for them. They are a little bit more sound, and so there's less chance of chatter. But if you set up a regular Bailey fine, you're not going to have any problem with chatter. Um, the, 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 with the, the bedrock, the, the, the connection from the frog to the sole is far more solid. Uh, there's, there's a lot more surface area in there. Um, and there's, there's several other things. That, that, um, they're a stiffer, thicker um, sidewalls and, and base. And so there's, there's a lot more that's just beefier, stronger, more solid planes. Um, so there's less chance of, of vibration and chatter. But, and, I mean, there's, there's a few other things in them that make them a little bit nicer, but there's really not a huge amount to them that's like, ooh, yes, that's definitely worth it. So, no, it, it's not worth it in my book. But there are a lot of people out there who absolutely swear by them, and it is the only thing that they'll use. And that's the reason why the price is high, because there's, there's a lot of people who have a demand for them. So, yeah. Um, but, again, in the end, it's, per it's personal. So. Have fun. <laughs> mm, let's see. Douglas Dyer Jr. asked, have you used any magnolia? I have some pretty 24-inch wide slabs drying. I have never played with magnolia. 24-inch. Wow, that would be a, a huge magnolia tree. I didn't even know they grew that, that wide. That would be, uh, be impressive. I was going to say, if it's from Texas, everything's bigger. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see. Pacific Coast Piper asked, how do you keep a bandsaw from trying to murder you? <laughs> <laughs> you keep it out of the shop. <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 I have all hand tools, but I do own a full set of power tools. I have a thickness planer, a table saw, routers, and whatnot. I do not own a bandsaw. Um, although of all the tools, I find that to be one of the, the safest, um, which is kind of odd because that's what they use to cut meat and bone and uh, in uh, butchering factories <laughs> so <laughs> but yeah having a healthy respect for power tools is a, is a valuable thing to have what's next mm -hmm. all right i think we're going to make this the last question since it's 854 unless you're Ooh, okay to that. yep Charles Kyler asked, do you have a good source for period fasteners like flathead screws that are not zinc coated? <laughs> I wish. Um, no, there, there, are, there are several other suppliers out there, um, but most of the time I'm looking for something that is so rare and random that um, they're just hard to come by. Um, and so a lot of times I'll end up like buying a box on eBay from uh, this that someone's pulled out of some barn um, and uh, they're, they're what I'm looking for. But no, I don't have any particular um, purchaser. I think most of the time the, I end up looking for brass hardware, um, and that tends to be a little bit easier to find because brass is cool, um, so you'd, it's easier to find uh, brass hardware out there. But I, I think more often than anything, I'll, I'll look on eBay when I'm looking for a specific, hard, uh, a specific fastener. Although when I was up in um, Canada, Oh, what's the name of that place? 
it was like the Bolt Warehouse or something like that that I went to with Hand Tool Rescue. And it was an amazing place with every bit of hardware and, and bolt and screw you'd ever imagine. It was rather impressive. Um, but yeah, there's not a regular place that I look for. So. Cool. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, next week, we're going to be doing the uh, the switch blade, not switch blade, the straight razors. So if you have your blade, um, stick around for that. We are going to be going into making the, um, the, the cover for it, which is a very delicate little thing to make. And there are a bunch of different ways of doing it, so we're going to be talking through um, several different options for that. Uh, and then hopefully the time after that, we will be getting into grinding and sharpening and then fitting the blade in. So stay tuned for that. It is going to be a very sharp video. Cook it, cook it, cook it, cook it. <laughs> I think on that note, we will end this one. So thank you for watching. Uh, looking forward to next week. And if you're going to be in Milwaukee this weekend, I'm looking forward to seeing you. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye.